percent of federal prisoners, but only 13 percent of the U.S. population. African Americans have a median household income of about $41,000, and that is $22,000 less than the national median. And 16.7 percent of African Americans were unemployed in April, two percentage points above that month's national jobless rate. There are big discrepancies here, Anthony. There are our elected leaders are also not representative of the population, Tony. Just 153 African Americans have served in the House of Representatives since 1789, and only 10 in the U.S. Senate. And of course, we've only had one black president. The numbers tell quite a story there, gentlemen. Outrage and protest over the death of George Floyd in police custody are the latest chapter of a long struggle by black Americans. The fight for racial justice and equality embodied by the civil rights movement spans the entire history of our country. So we spoke with a number of civil rights activists from different generations to get their perspectives on what we're all witnessing today. We're seeing the same case over and over. Like we're marching for George Floyd today, who are we marching for tomorrow? Right now, in 2020, we're still existing in a world, in a space, especially here in America, where racism and anti-blackness is deeply rooted in our everyday system. I'm really sad for the family of George Floyd. They killed him like a dog in the street. I'm frustrated we can't get justice. I'm emotional because I don't know what I will tell my, you know, my little black children that I'm raising about how to go out and operate in this world. The issues we face today are present but not permanent. Uh, the violence of the police present not permanent. But there are more and more people who realize that the system as it's currently designed is designed. People made this up. And because people made it up, we can make something better. At present, we are in the midst of a protest. When I was a uh, freshman in school in Atlanta and Dr. King was assassinated, I did take to the street by the very violent. I was seeking to do damage, I was seeking to hurt, but I realized that that is not really going to change. So when I see the young black men and women out there, I know a little bit about how they feel. I myself was 11 years old when Trayvon Martin was murdered. After that, I also lived through watching Ferguson. I'm excited and hopeful because I see people out in the streets. I can't breathe! Well, they are the grandchildren of the civil rights movement, and I cannot tell you how proud I am of them uh, because for far too long, their voices uh, were not heard. It brought it back to the days that I was beat bad by police officers. Um, civil rights leaders encouraged me to go in law enforcement, and I turned my pain into purpose. For every movement, there's always been young people who are leading the way. And what I hope will be different this time is that they actually listen to young people. I think Generation Z has had enough. I'm a child of the civil rights movement. My father was shot February 8th, 1968 in the Orangeburg Massacre. This is like 1918 meets 1968. Um, you have a great pandemic. You have a country that is teetering on edge, but we have to work together to overcome. And I'm hopeful that we can have a sense of understanding. I know of a hope that carried me when I was in the street for 400 days in St. Louis in 2014. But I know that we are fighting for a world that we believe in, but we have not yet seen. I'm always telling a story about a world that I know is true, but I have not been to. We took Dr. King's dream and as a blueprint and began to build. If you really want to see a revolution start, you don't have to take a gun and face. You stay on the moral high ground. And the violence won't be yours, it'll be from the other side. That's the way it was in civil rights. That's the way it was before. And I think if we hold that far high ground, we will win. Boy, I get, guys, I get goosebumps looking at those images.